Hello, 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 and welcome to this edition of the Jolly Heretic. I have a very special guest for you today, a returning guest at the Jolly Heretic Public House, that is Professor Sam Vaknin, and we are going to talk about borderline personality disorder, which is a fascinating thing. Sam, hello. Yes, hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you again. Now, last time you were on here, we talked about narcissism, but this time I want to focus on this. So, uh, first of all, how would you sort of define borderline personality disorder? What, what exactly is it? Well, I think rather than defining it, perhaps, let me focus on six features of borderline personality disorder. The first is what I call introject inconstancy, the inability to create an internal representation of an external object, of a, of a person. So the borderline is unable to form an internal object, a representation, an avatar, a snapshot, if you wish, of people in her life, especially significant or meaningful people in her life. And this is introject inconstancy. The second thing is that the borderline has, um, more or less like the narcissist, has problems with her self-perception. The narcissist has something known as bad object. The narcissist has a constellation of voices inside himself or herself that inform the narcissist that he is unworthy, that he is bad, that he is ugly or stupid or whatever. Voices that put the narcissist down. The borderline, on the other hand, has the opposite kind of object. She has what one, one could call a good object. It's, it's an object that self-aggrandizes. It's an object that in, internal object, a set of voices, a set of introjects that inform the borderline that she is actually perfection reified, that she is, you know, and, and it's kind of internalized grandiosity. On the other hand, the borderline is prone to misconduct, bad behavior, and this creates a dissonance. The borderline has a self-perception as a good person, and but cannot deny the fact that she misbehaves very often. And so this creates a dissonance and this dissonance is resolved typically via victimhood. The borderline tends to claim to have been a victim of circumstances, of people, and so on and so forth. The next um, very important feature of borderline personality disorder is what is known as the twin anxieties. Borderlines are anxious about being abandoned. Abandonment anxiety, the clinical term is separation insecurity. Um, is a dominant feature of borderline personality disorder. Uh, borderlines are terrified. They anticipate abandonment. They imagine abandonment. They dwell on abandonment and so on. So this how, is how is it consistent with having a, you, you indicate that they have almost a positive sense of who they are, like a, a, a narcissism. So how is that? Their behaviors, their behaviors are bad. They do realize that they are misbehaving and they, they understand. I mean, they're not, <laughs> they are rational beings after all. They understand that they are pushing the partner away ultimately. So they're terrified of abandonment on the one hand. On the other hand, they have what is known as engulfment anxiety. It is a fear of being ass assimilated and consumed by the intimate partner, the special friend, etc., etc. So this creates what is known as approach avoidance repetition compulsion. The borderline approaches you and idealizes you and uh, fears that you might or sh should abandon her if you come to know her better, if you come to witness her misbehavior, you may abandon her. So she's terrified about this. But then when you respond, when you when you when you prefer, when you when you provide love and caring and compassion and empathy, the borderline panics. She develops engulfment anxiety and she runs away. Approach avoidance, repetition, compulsion. There's a Freudian term, by the way. Mm -hmm. One of the most important features of, if not the most important feature, features of borderline personality disorder is known as dysregulation. Now there's emotional dysregulation, there's also mood lability. In other words, the inability to somehow control, stabilize um, emotions and moods, uh, the tendency to be overwhelmed by emotions, um, drown in, in emotions, the, the tendency to act with lability, to ups and downs, cycles, to, to stimuli, to environmental stimuli, and so on and so forth. So this is why the borderline is looking for someone who would regulate her, who would offer what is known as external regulation. 
she can't regulate, she can't control, she can't discipline herself, she can't stabilize herself emotionally and mood-wise. So she's looking for, for an intimate partner or a special friend who would do this for her. She outsources her regulation. She says, you are my rock. You, are, you, are, you provide me with a sense of safety and stability. When I'm with you, my moods are stable. When I'm with you, my emotions don't overwhelm me, don't drown me, don't dysregulate me. So she expects the intimate partner or the friend to offer this external regulation because she can't do it from the inside. Another feature of, of uh, sorry, of borderline personality disorder is uh, known as switching. The transition from one self-state to another self-state, for example, from a borderline self-state to a psychopathic self-state, where the, the, the borderline essentially loses one identity and acquires another. And this is known as identity disturbance. Now, I'm using the word identity uh, judiciously, and so do other scholars, because the whole identity, the whole entire identity changes. It's not just a few superficial things. Or, I mean, everything changes. Values. Can, I, can I can I hold you? Can I do you mind? Um, can I ask you about a couple of things before we before we move on? So, first of all, um, uh, why is it that she cannot? And it is normally a female. We'll, we'll cover that in a minute. But I, it's traditionally understood to be more female than male. This, but I want to look at the male aspect of it. But uh, why can she not stabilize herself? Other people can. What, why, what, what is the problem with the borderline? What's the under the thing that underpins? We don't know. We don't know. We do know that there is a hereditary component. There is some genetic vulnerability because we know, for example, that if you have a first degree relative who has been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, your chance of being diagnosed is five times higher. So this is strongly indicative of some hereditary component. We also know there are brain abnormalities in borderline personality disorder. It's the same with psychopathy, by the way, also brain abnormalities. And all. So it seems to be a confluence of a, some kind of genetic predisposition coupled with some brain structural or functional problems, issues. Um, but it's all, all this template is triggered in what is known as adverse childhood experiences in, in dysfunctional families or exposure to bad parenting or, or peer, peer rejection or, you know. So when you're exposed to adversity um, and you have this genetic propensity and, and uh, problems with your brain functioning and structure, then you might end up being uh, someone with borderline personality. Yeah, why, why, why does that adversity um, induce it? Well, adversity generally induces uh, personality disorders. There is close linkage between childhood childhood adversity and um, or adverse experiences, and for example, narcissism, uh, borderline personality disorder, uh, to some extent, schizoid and paranoid personality disorders, and so on and so forth. It seems that the best explanation I came across, and there are quite a few, but the best one I've come I've come across is that there is a disruption in the formation of the self. There's a disruption in the constellation and integration of everything into a, a coherent, cohesive, functional sense of self, actual self, what Freud called at the time ego. I mean, never mind what's the language we, we choose to use. But this core identity, this feeling that you are, this becoming into you mm -hmm. as an idiosyncratic being, this seems to be disrupted by childhood adversity. And so you end up having what is known as an empty schizoid core. Emptiness, where you should have been. Absence, masquerading as presence, you know? And so this absence, this emptiness, can provide regulation. There's no one there to regulate you. And rather than internal regulation, you resort to a variety of solutions to regulate externally. So you become dependent on an intimate partner or a special friend, or you introduce drama into your life, or you self-harm. Self-harming has a regulatory function. When how, you so? Self -harm. how so? How so? Well, when you self-harm, for example, you feel alive. When you self-harm, when you cut, when you mutilate, when you, sell, when you self trash sexually, I mean, there's a variety of ways to self-harm. When you're being reckless, when you're being self-destructive and so on. All these are forms of self-harming. When you self-harm, you feel alive and, and, and you are able to drown 
the dysregulated emotions. There's so much drama outside. There's so much risk, so much danger, so much, so much is happening. The outside noise drowns the inside noise. So this is a form of regulation. So, so it, it, it allows you. So it's like, uh, yeah. So it 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 it's, it it allows you to to not focus on the emptiness. It allows you to. We all do this. We all do this. What is the entertainment industry? What is this escape, escapism that is... Yeah, yeah, it's very industry? interesting because there was some analysis of love poetry which found that about 80% of love poets have insecure attachment styles, which is, <laughs> which is <laughs> consistent with the borderline's focus on like romantic sure, love, yeah. romantic love and, 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 and this sort of thing. So the, the other thing I was going to ask for, um, before we, you, you go back to your <laughs> big six um, is the, the nature of the self. So we, we all... Um, um, have a uh, alter subtly how we present ourselves um, in accordance to who we're with, right? So you and I are both academics and whatever, and so I'm 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 just sort of I'm I'm quite comfortable with this is I feel almost this is basically me, but I I, I can see that if I was with somebody else uh, who was a bit different, I might slightly change how I was presenting myself and and uh, you know it'd be a little bit different. Um, what, what are you saying that in, in normal people there's there's a, there's a variety of social masks that we wear, but with with people that are BPD they just dramatically jump between masks. Is that what does it mean to have a labile sense? Of I self? would say that using using the metaphors that you've used, and which by the way are common metaphors in psychology, we have the concept of persona, persona, <coughs> which is a Jungian concept. We have the concept of the mask, which is Irving Goffman's concept. Irving Goffman was a sociologist. So we have this concept of mask or persona in, in psychology and sociology. And yes, we all wear masks or personas which allow us to function in a variety of social settings and in accordance with various demands and expectations as to functioning um, in, in the workplace, in church, and, and so on and so forth. But there is something underlying the, all these masks there is some there is some common denominator there's some coherent thread that holds them together whereas in borderline personality disorder they are only the masks the masks have taken over mm. in in a he healthy whatever that means yeah but in a normal person statistically speaking in a normal person there is an agency a core which controls the masks which kind of trots out the masks is um, so there is a kind of production director or casting director, which says, okay, now you should use mask number seven. And this is known as se the self states or the, the ego states or the sub personalities theory, um, first suggested by Philip Bromberg in the 80s. So he said that we have this casting agent or, or producer that just chooses, makes choices as to which self-states would be most appropriate in a variety of settings. The borderline doesn't have this casting director. It's as if as if the, the, the casting director or the producer has gone AWOL uh -huh. and all that's left are the masks and they, have, they acquire a life of their own and they take over. It's very horror show kind of thing. <laughs> and... And then they have a mind of their own, the masks, and this is essentially switching. Right. So, so that's one thing you, you were moving on to, which was idealized the idealization uh, splitting um, uh, notion. So, uh, could, you know, why, why do they? Uh, uh, if you were, you know, a young chap and you had a, you 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 were going out with a girl and you you wanted to sign that she was borderline, presumably one of the signs, assuming she hasn't got a big cut on her wrist, um, is that she idealizes you. She she thinks you're like the, the, the she can't think about anything else but you. She she she, she finds you amazing. Her, her whole day is spent. She thinks about you when she's crossing the road. She thinks about you when she's cooking. In every spare moment. Now, why why do they do that? Why do they idealize? They're not, they're not the only ones to do that. Of course, narcissists do that. Um, idealization fulfills different roles, different functions in narcissism and in borderline. In narcissism, idealization is is required. So that the narcissist can then proceed to the shared fantasy, to, to construct a shared fantasy, uh, within which the partner is essentially a maternal figure. While the borderline needs to idealize, because she's about to hand over control of her mind to someone. It's terrifying. It's a terrifying proposition. 
the intimate partner of the borderline, the special friend of the borderline, is about to take over her internal world, is about to become the main regulator of her emotions, in charge of her moods. And to a large extent, her reality testing, her interface with reality, it's, it's a state of, it's the equivalent of being a hostage, a Stockholm syndrome kind of way. But so this is a terrifying decision to make. And you want to be sure that you're making it with the right person. You want to be mm-hmm. sure that you will not be taken advantage of, that you will not fall prey to a predator and so on. So but, you need to idealize. But couldn't it be also that uh, you say that they experience these emotions very strongly and they experience, neg- my understanding, they experience negative emotions very strongly, a sense of emptiness. Um, and positive. And, and positive, and not positive. positive. So you said that they experience positive emotions very strongly, that, that, that they, they matter and they're important. But, but they experience also, both, negative and positive, very strongly. Right, okay. So, But when they're experiencing these negative emotions very strongly, is that, that they're worthless and whatever, um, then presumably uh, one way you can cope with that is itself by creating a fantasy. Because isn't it that you get borderline people that they will, let's say, their fantasy object will be a celebrity, will be a, a man they haven't even met. So there's no question, there's no hope. Well, maybe there's a tiny bit of hope, but there's no realistic hope that that person is going to uh, be their real life friend that's going to regulate their emotions for them. So couldn't it be that the the, the, fa- the fantasizing about somebody who's perfect and wonderful is going to make their life great? Is is this living in a fantasy? That is a way of coping with the negative feelings. Before- fantasy is a critical feature of narcissism and of and of borderline. <clears throat> but these are different types of fantasies. It is a narcissist who believes himself unconsciously, to be bad, unworthy, inadequate, and needs to compensate for this by pretending to be godlike. So, and he can do this only in a fantastic space, obviously. Yeah. Ah. Okay, well, a bit of a, bit of a, bit of a problem with, I don't know if it's a problem with my internet or his internet. Hello, you back? Reality, reality intervened. Fantastic space. He can do this only in a fantastic space. Yeah, so he needs he needs to resort to fantasy because reality would push back. Reality wouldn't allow him to maintain his self delusion as godlike. This is the narcissist. The borderline is exactly the opposite. The borderline believes herself to be a good object. She believes herself to be perfection reified. She, but she realizes that she is not in control of her emotions and moods, and this makes her act out it makes her misbehave this lack of regulation makes her misbehave causes her to misbehave so she wants to get rid of this feature it's it's a bug as far as she's concerned it's a bug not a feature and she wants to get rid of it debug debug herself and this she can do only through the agency of someone who is godlike someone who is ideal someone who who she could feel is a secure base someone she could hand over uh, control Mm. over herself too but nobody is that so she she is she is simply focusing on all of the good sides of this person and ignoring the bad sides which or, is or, fantasy. or totally inventing things yeah but that's a, that, be... that's itself a, that's itself a fancy that's my point so what what what, what is it that causes her then so the, the, in my understanding is that in these relationships she'll have this fantasy object and then as the relationship progresses between the whatever kind of man ends up in in the relationship with the borderline woman we can look at that in a minute um, and um, and her then then you have the de de idealization. Um, so why does that process take place? Because of engulfment anxiety. When the partner reacts favorably to his new role as the godlike regulator of her emotions and moods, the guru, the teacher, the father figure, I don't know what. When he reacts favorably to that, he begins to be loving and caring, to display empathy and compassion and concern and and so on and so forth. The borderline feels suffocated. She feels as though she is being held hostage. She feels imprisoned, shackled, incarcerated. She needs to run away. She feels consumed. She feels subsumed in him. She reacts very badly to what is known as the symbiotic state or merger and fusion. And then she begins to devalue the the intimate partner or the special friend. And she transforms uh, the intimate partner into a persecutory object, into an enemy, basically, an internalized enemy. And she says, he's very controlling. He he doesn't let me live my life. He's all over me. He doesn't let me have a minute to my own, of my own. I mean, I don't have my private time, private space. I need to get away. And she runs away. And she runs away hatefully. 
she becomes, as I said, hateful, rejecting, abusive, and so on and so forth, just to ascertain that there will be no, no reenactment of the engulfment phase, to get rid of him permanently. <laughs> but then she regrets it because she has abandonment anxiety. Mm. She has brought on her, her abandonment. Mm -hmm. It's preemptive abandonment. She created the very abandonment that she's terrified of. So then she hoovers. She goes back to the same intimate partner that she has just reviled. And she says, you, you, you're actually the best. You're wonderful. And she re-idealizes him. And mm. this is an endless cycle. She can do this like 200 times. Mm. So what about, what about if, if, I was thinking that if, if, you, if you, you idealize a person and you, and you basically farm out your emotional regulation to that person, then it's almost, a, um, how can I put it, a, a narcissistic kind of idea, not a narcissist, that's not the wrong word, an almost solipsistic idea that, that that person understands you. And therefore, if that person um, upsets you, that's his fault because he must have known. Um, that's and then, one, that's one and then well, you, you go mad at him. It's all his fault. That's one aspect of it. Whenever, of course, the, the intimate partner deviates or diverges from the idealized image, uh, then, of course, this creates frustration and aggression. So the intimate partner should never deviate or diverge or contradict the idealized image of him in the borderline's mind. And if he ever does, it's cause for aggression. But that doesn't lead the borderline to abandon the intimate partner. The borderline actually abandons the intimate partner when he does conform to the idealized image. There's no winning with the borderline. If you conform with the idealized image, then she experiences engulfment anxiety, enmeshment anxiety, and she runs away. If you don't conform with the idealized image, then you're the enemy, and she devalues you, and she sticks around, but she begins to misbehave, act out, drama, uh, betrayal, and so on and so forth. So there's no winning strategy with the borderline. None. No, okay. So that's a very interesting point. So what you would expect then in a um is that a relationship between well, I'll go on to it in a minute, but um if there was a relationship between two borderlines, let's say, which I hypothesize based on genetic similarity and the 50% heritability of this <laughs> would happen. Um, then, then you're going to get these cycles. It will go through cycles of being together, breaking up, being together, breaking up, being together like that. And they will be very, very intense. That's what no, we're... actually, borderlines do not team up. Um, theoretical assumptions aside, they don't team up because another borderline cannot provide regulations. They are dysregulated. The borderline seeks external regulation. She needs someone stable, someone safe, someone predictable, someone present. And another borderline cannot provide any of these. The other borderline is equally dysregulated, equally crazy making, equally absent, equally present. They'd, equally... They'd, be, they'd be attracted to each other, though. No, they wouldn't be, actually. Well, they'd have the, to be. The they would be. Would they, would, okay, what about a narcissist? A narcissist. Yes, the, yes, the borderline would be very attracted to a narcissist because okay, the narcissist. Let's, talk, let's talk about that. So, the, 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 in general, I mean, the. <clears throat> Um, the borderline is more like, well, I don't know, I know you've argued against this to some extent, but the borderline is more likely to be female, the narcissist is more likely to be male. Um, no, I'm not, I'm not arguing against it, it's just the statistics, about half of all narcissists um, are female and half of all borderlines are male. Now, it is true that originally borderline personality disorder was a female thing. Um, there was a kind of gender bias built into the diagnosis, and it was a female thing. And until the 1980s, about 75% of people diagnosed with borderline personality disorder were women. Um, but that has changed nowadays. I think one of the reasons it may have changed is the dissolution of gender roles. We live in a world which is essentially unigender, where we have, we have um, only males, only females, if you wish. We, we don't have... There's no clear distinction between genders. So I think all these gender-based uh, diagnoses are, are kind of falling apart. That applies to narcissism. 75% of people diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder were men until the 1980s. And today it's 50-50 because women are becoming much more masculine, much more masculine. Their, their self-definition and self-image is totally masculine. So, of course, they're, they're becoming much more narcissistic. 
Okay, but um, uh, my model that I think tends to work, genetic similarity, would certainly I would think that there would be genetic significant crossover between narcissism and BPD. But yes, what, they, are, what, they are attracted to each other, true. Why are they attracted to each other? Why is the narcissist attracted, attracted to the BPD and then vice versa? Start with the BPD. The narcissist, okay. the narcissist project an image of supreme self-confidence, um, extreme stability and predictability, self-conviction, um, uh, immutable values, and so on and so forth. The narcissist is, is a rock, pretends to be a rock actually underneath it's a nobody it's an emptiness but okay <clears throat> the narcissist is gives a very convincing rendition of a very stable sage um you know person who can be relied upon whose behavior is totally uh predictable and and so so this is exactly what the borderline is looking for this overconfidence of narcissists is very alluring to the borderline she falls for it she believes that she has found the ultimate external regulator. <laughs> and so she falls for narcissists. Well, narcissists, on the other hand, um, regard borderlines as an ideal partner in the shared fantasy because borderlines are prone to fantasy as well. So there's a collusion here. There's a collaboration in the, in the formation of a fantasy which would be gratifying to the narcissist and to the borderline. The borderline idolizes the narcissist. The borderline does treat the narcissist as godlike, idealizes him and so on. That's exactly what he needs. He needs this source of narcissistic supply. And she does this within a fantasy which upholds and buttresses the narcissist's grandiosity. So she's perfect. She's a perfect mate. And he's the perfect mate because he's strong. He's resilient. He's, uh, you know, powerful. He's amazing. He's, he's everything. And he can be trusted to regulate the borderline's internal world. So she believes. And so they are a match made, made in hell or heaven. <laughs> um, but what about the idea, let's say there was an age gap. So let's say there was a large age gap and you had two people with BPD. Then presumably if the man was older, he you'd have the genetic similarity because they've both got BPD. You'd have the like the bonding over experiencing similar things, but his BPD would be less bad and more regulated, maybe. And he would seem more narcissistic. In that sense, he'd be more like a narcissist. So th that borderline, that borderline uh, women tend to be attracted to older men in mm. principle because of um, they perceive them as father figures and and so on. Um, beyond the age of forty-five. It's very rare to diagnose someone with borderline personality disorder. Even that's someone what, that's what I mean. So the person could have had borderline personality yes. disorder when he was younger. So yes. then the, he'll completely understand the much younger female. Yes. Um, and so there'll be a strong bonding that way, and there'll be the genetic similarity. Yes, because uh, <clears throat> by the age of forty-five or fifty, that's no, no longer a borderline. About 81% of people with borderline personality disorder diagnosis can no longer be diagnosed after age 45. Spontaneous remission, which is another reason to believe that it's genetic or brain thing rather than psychological. No. That's fascinating. So that would that would make sense of a number of things I've observed. So you'd, you'd have you, so you might have a chap who's got borderline used to be borderline has borderline traits. He'll be very very genetically similar to this woman, but basically he'll he he'll come across as stable and perhaps even yes. he will not only come across as stable. He's likely to be stable and regulated and, and so. so well, we might have some things that aren't that regulated, but like I see what you mean. Okay, now what would be the difference between a male that has borderline personality and a female in in, in terms of how they present? The Narcissism. Male, male borderlines are likely to emphasize grandiosity, power, antisocial uh, behavior, and they are likely to be much more focused on fantasy as a tool to regulate their sense of grandiosity and self-perception as godlike and so on. So male borderlines, and I, I, I propose recently a new diagnosis, a new kind of diagnostic uh, category of covert borderline. I suggested that men who are diagnosed with borderline, actually covert borderline. That's a hybrid between narcissist and borderline. So I think men who are diagnosed with borderline actually 
narcissistic borderlines or borderline narcissist or something. They're not pure borderline. I haven't come across in well over 30 years of doing this. I, I've never come across a man who would have qualified to a pure classical diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. There was always narcissism present or psychopathy present or something present, paranoid, paranoid personality disorder. It was contaminated. It was never unadulterated borderline personality disorder. I have come across many women who definitely qualify for qualify for an unadulterated BPD diagnosis. So this hmm. is, I think, this is the difference that men with BPD are narcissistic or psychopathic or paranoid. Or, they're always borderline plus hmm. something. I see. Um, no, I, I just find that very. A, a very interesting idea that you would, that, as I say, I, I, I'm trying to um, um, square the circle of genetic similarity, which seems to me to have a huge level of predict predictive validity with what you're saying. And one way that, round it, as you say, would be age difference. Man is less BPD and then the woman is BPD. She's younger. So they, they bond over things that they experience in common hugely. Um, they, they bond because they're genetically similar. Um, and then you presumably would get this idealization of the man um, and de-idealization, de but it would happen to some extent, possibly even both ways, <coughs> if he had some traits himself. Um, another, another way to look at it and to assuage your anxiety over genetic similarity is uh, to regard both conditions as post-traumatic conditions. Both borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder is a reaction to early childhood trauma and abuse. Now, there are many forms of trauma and abuse. Spoiling the child, pampering the child is a form of abuse. Uh, I mean, there are many types of abuse. But children who've been exposed to situations where they couldn't separate from the, from the parental figures, especially the mother, couldn't form boundaries, couldn't individuate, couldn't become individuals, Etc., etc., where the, there was a disruption in the formation of a, of a self, a boundaried self, ego functions. These kind of children have been traumatized in many ways, and they're likely to react by becoming codependents, by becoming borderlines, or by becoming narcissists. So I don't see much of a I, I am not I don't belong to the to the school that regards borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder as that different. I think they're both post-traumatic conditions. And yes, there could be bonding over this, mm. this joint experience, this common experience of early childhood. Traumas and pathologies resonate. When you come across someone, the first thing that resonates is your pathologies, actually. <laughs> Only much later do you come to, to know each other on other levels, like your personality, your preferences, your hobbies, your likes, your dislikes. Your... Yeah, that comes later. But the first thing that resonates very powerfully is your pathologies. Mm. And if you both come from a post-traumatic background and you have a post-traumatic condition, regardless of labels, then you're likely to bond. And that would... Yeah, I see. I see, I see. And then, and and then you, you both go through the same thing, the couple, where they would idealize each other they would they would de-idealize each other. They would break up or something. I don't know, but whatever. They would rupture. They would then intensely miss each other, um, and then potentially they would um, the the what was the term you used? I wrote it down. Um, <laughs> oh, oh god, where have I written it down? But uh, the engulfment thing, yes. Uh, the the engulfment uh, would, would would happen. It would completely go away, and then presumably there would be a moment where they would re-idealize each other again, and it would be like it was in the old, yeah. and it would just carry yeah. on. Let me let me tell you this. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is the book that has taught us that there is a difference between narcissistic personality disorder and borderline personality disorder. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is used only in very few countries. The United States, most notably, to some extent the United Kingdom, not fully, and maybe Canada. The book that is used by 80% of humanity is not the DSM. It's another book. It's known as the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases. And in the ICD, in the 11th edition, there is no distinction between borderline and narcissistic personality disorders. The ICD claims, as I've been claiming for th three decades, the ICD claims that there's only one personality disorder, one diagnosis. 
And that sometimes people are more narcissistic and at other times they're more borderline and sometimes they become psychopathic, etc., etc. There are manifestations, there are expressions of this single underlying diagnosis or diagn clinical entity. So this, I think, is much closer to reality. Any clinician, any practitioner would tell you that a patient may present with narcissistic personality disorder and then the next week, that very patient would be very borderline. And then the third week, he would become psychopathic. And the fourth week, he would be paranoid. That's nonsense. All these differential diagnoses, all these artificial distinctions in the DSM are nonsensical. They have to do with insurance. They have to do with ph the pharmaceutical industry, not with reality. In reality, we are rivers. We are not ponds. We, we infl we're in flux. And in reality, when you have a personality disorder, you are likely to have the manifestations of all types of personality disorder. Your personality is effed. Your personality is screwed. So the minute you failed in forming a personality, a self, an ego, whatever you want to call it, a core identity, whenever you failed in that, you are likely to display behaviors which are sometimes identified with narcissism, sometimes with borderline, sometimes with psychopathy, sometimes with paranoid, sometimes with schizoid, etc., etc. So I think... This whole conversation, um, I think you, you're right in the sense that people with personality disorders, with a personality disorder, would tend to be attracted to each other. Mm. Regardless of how this personality disorder manifests from time to time. It's true that people with personality disorders are attracted to each other. This has been confirmed in numerous studies. But the distinctions between NPD and BPD, this is an American thing. It's not accepted throughout the world. And not only an American thing, it's a counterfactual thing. It's all narcissists are borderline. All borderlines are narcissists. All narcissists and borderlines are grandiose. They are all paranoid. All psychopaths are paranoid. All schizoids are borderline sometimes. I mean, it's... it's can, I, can I actually check on nothing, which is interesting? That um, One thing that can be noted about when you have a relationship with a borderline is that if that person is under a great deal of stress, uh, she can dissociate and uh, become almost a, like a psychopath, like go, go into a state where she's saying, just oh, fuck it, fuck it, fuck everybody. I, don't, I, 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 I want to go home. I don't want to be here. I can't stand this. I don't, I don't want to be here anymore. Oh, fuck it. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, everyone hey, hates me. Right now, this. They literally go into a, a, it's like a psychotic state um, and then gradually come out of it again. Can you, can you tell me a bit about that? Like what, what's, the, what's the reason for that and uh, how that occurs? When borderlines are exposed to stress, anxiety, including anticipated anxiety, anticipatory anxiety, anticipating abandonment, for example, or rejection, exposure to humiliation in public or in private, etc., etc. When they're exposed to these stressors, they are not built to cope with them because they can't regulate emotions. They, there's a problem with emotional regulation. So what happens then is a process known as decompensation. The defense mechanisms of the borderline shut down one by one. She becomes defenseless, uh, skinless, if you wish. She's in direct contact with reality without her typical defenses, including fantasy defense. So then she is very, she becomes extremely dysregulated. Her emotions sweep over her, drown her, and overwhelm her. And in reaction to this, she switches. There's a process known as switching. She switches from one self-state to another, and typically she switches to a self-state known as secondary psychopathy. It's a self-state where she becomes a lot more, because a psychopath doesn't have emotional dysregulation. It's a protective self-state. It's a little like multiple personality disorder. Mm. She switches to another personality who is better able to cope with the stress and the anxiety, and who doesn't, another, a second self-state who doesn't, which doesn't, um, dysregulate. So she's much more, uh, and then this second self-state, the secondary psychopathy, is reckless, defiant, um, violent or aggressive, um, and so on and so forth. And so she displays behaviors which are known as acting out. She acts out. She, she, be, she, she crazy makes. She becomes violent. She could be violent. She could throw objects or, or break objects or whatever. 
or she could self-mutilate or self-harm, or she could attack you violently. So, I mean, it's, it's an adaptive reaction to a very, very unstable and dangerous world. I mean, that's what psychopathology psychopath yes. yes. evolved to an environment of chaos. Yeah, it's like so, she suspends herself and allows another sub personality to take over, because that sub personality is much better equipped to deal with stress and anxiety by virtue of being psychopathic, violent, aggressive, um, reckless, defiant, etc. Which is exactly what's needed in order to fend off stress and belittle in anxiety, minimize it, ameliorate it. Also, sometimes you know one notices uh, that they can go into other states. For example, I know one personal uh, uh, that uh, adopted almost like a childlike persona, like uh, uh, literally, like it was like to suddenly adopting the a, 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 a an American accent, which wasn't this person, it's not American, um, and B almost like speaking to a six-year-old or a seven-year-old um, at, at a moment of some stress. Yes, uh, regression is one of the options. There are multiple self-states. It's not limited to the psychopathic thing. Uh, if, the, if the borderline feels threatened, she is likely to resort to the psychopathic self-state. Mm -hmm. But if she feels... Um, if she doesn't feel threatened, but she feels that things are going badly, things are going wrong, but she doesn't feel threatened, mm -hmm. then she might infantilize in order to, in order to secure uh, compassion and love and attachment and caring. So, yeah, the regressive self-state is, is also common, infantilization. What, what other self-states are there apart from psychopathic and regressive? Essentially everything. Paranoid self-state. Borderlines become highly paranoid in, in certain, under certain circumstances. That's very common. A schizoid self-state, a borderline would isolate herself, avoid a promiscuous borderline would suddenly not have sex for two years, you know, or so that's a schizoid self state. And what what was set off a schizoid self state? A schizoid self state is the outcome of extreme um, narcissistic injury, extreme rejection, or extreme abandonment, and this is known as mortification, borderline mortification. So borderline would mortification would uh, would induce a total withdrawal from the world. Total avoidance of the world. It is known as constriction. Her life would constrict. So if you, would... if you rejected a borderline, if you said, I don't want to have sex with you, I don't want to, then, then she might respond by going into a schizoid self-state. Um, you... That's rare. But if you were to reject her in public, in front of people who are meaningful to her, significant people, you would have, you would do it in public in a humiliating manner. Uh, and, and you would do it unequivocally, and then you would go with another girl within minutes, that's likely to induce mortification. And she's, she can, she might react with schizoid self-state. And then she would isolate herself in a room. She would never exit the room. She would never meet anyone, talk to anyone, have sex with anyone, and so on and so forth. And this could last, you know, a week or two or two years. There's no telling. What is their attitude like towards objective truth? I mean, do they, You might, I can imagine that you get a borderline who, let's say, do they, if they're into fantasy, presumably in one moment they might admit that they've, I don't know, had sex with lots of men, and then another moment say, oh no, I'm a virgin, I'm not, you know, no way, you know, I mean, is, are they like that? Do they have different selves depending on the circumstances? Um, borderline, borderlines have, as you noted, have dis they're dissociative, they have dissociation as a, as a dominant feature. Actually, one of the diagnostic criteria of borderline personality disorder is dissociation. So borderlines are prone to amnesia. They're prone to depersonalization. Uh, I, I was there, but it wasn't me. I was observing myself from the outside. I was on autopilot. I didn't feel that I'm present. So that's depersonalization. Or derealization. The whole thing was a dream. Uh, the whole thing was a nightmare. I, I, it was surreal. I didn't feel it's true. I didn't feel it's real, etc. So these are known as dissociative responses. Borderlines are prone to confabulation, uh, but also to lying. The difference between confabulation and lying is that in, you believe, you, you trust your, your own confabulations. Confabulation is intended to bridge a memory gap. So if you ask a borderline what she has done yesterday, and she, she can't remember because she dissociated, she would invent a plausible explanation or a plausible narrative. And then she would believe in this narrative, even though she just invented it, concocted it, yeah. That's confabulation. 
But borderlines also lie. They, they, they have a propensity to lie. They're pathological liars. What borderlines are not is insane or, um, I don't know, crazy. Uh, the, although Kernberg, the father of the field, suggested in 1975 that borderlines are on the verge of being crazy. That's why, that's why the word borderline, they're mm. on the border between neurosis and psychosis. And borderlines do degen degenerate or devolve into psychotic state when they're exposed to extreme, prolonged, uh, hopeless stress and anxiety. They can devolve to a psychotic state. But the vast majority of the time, they're not psychotic. They know damn well what they're doing. They know they're lying. They know they're being manipulative or Machiavellian. They, they are, in this sense, they're highly psychopathic, in this sense. Even when they are not in a psychopathic, secondary psychopathic self-state, borderlines are pretty, pretty psychopathic. Mm -hmm. For example, they're very manipulative. So when a borderline would tell you one day that she's been promiscuous, and then the next day she would deny it and say, I'm a virgin, uh, that's because she's lying. And maybe because she has forgotten that she told you, because she has dissociated that part. But it's not because she's psychotic or in fantasy or whatever. It's utterly goal-oriented, usually. Okay. And so uh, you have said, um, I mean, you've said you know, you're a self-aware narcissist. We, talk, we talked about this on the, the, the last time uh, we, you, you interviewed. And consistent with what you you have told me, you say you, you, you find borderlines attractive. Now, which again, that could be partly shared trauma, partly genetics, whatever. Um, but um, how <laughs> do, do you, presumably, you must have come up with methods of regulating these women. Of, of, I mean, you, you talk about this cycle of idealization, deal. It's very, very dramatic and traumatic and uh, <clears throat> discombobulating. So what, uh, for those that, what, that want to go to the end of the rainbow, Dorothy, uh, to use your term, um, what 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 uh, methods do you employ? I don't, I don't, because I uh, my grandiosity won't allow me to make concessions or any modifications to who I am. So I I keep failing with borderline women because I refuse to act the role. Um, so my case is not representative. Okay, so what would you... Okay. A, typical, a typical narcissist uh, would project confidence. As I said, the narcissist regards the borderline as an ideal partner in his shared fantasy because she idolizes him and idealizes him and regards him as godlike and hands over to him control. So he controls her. So because he controls her, this assuages, this reduces or mitigates his abandonment anxiety, his own abandonment anxiety. So she's perfect. As far as the narcissist is concerned, she is perfect. So many narcissists, myself not included, but many narcissists would make concessions, would compromise, would act the role of a secure base, a rock, someone who can be trusted. And, and they would absorb, absorb the emotional outbursts of the borderline. They would um, create for the borderline frameworks, uh, rigid structured frameworks, which would allow her to regulate, what kind they, of would, they what would kind collude of in the borderline's drama and fantasy. Sorry. What kind of frameworks would these be? Well, rich, uh, routines, rituals, traditions, common traditions, um, plans for the future, promises, uh, and so on and so forth. These are all frameworks which regulate somehow, allow the borderline to regulate somehow. So, right. but this is all. This is all a show. That's all. That's all a facade, of course. So presumably the worst thing you could do would be to explain to the borderline she has borderline, and this would puncture her, her fantasy. Most uh, borderlines know that they have borderlines, but knowing something is not the same as internalizing it. I know that I have narcissism, so <laughs> it didn't make an iota of difference, a scintilla of difference in, in who I am and how I behave. Uh, knowledge must be coupled with an emotional correlate in order to produce insight, which is transformative. And so the borderline might well reach the conclusion that she's a borderline, but it would mean nothing to her, because as far as she's concerned, she's a perfect entity. She's, a, she's a, you know, she is godlike. She is a divinity. And so she should be worshipped. Again, I don't quite understand. If she if she is divinity and she can be worshipped, then how is, does, does that 
is that congruous with having such intense negative feelings such that you want to cut yourself and, and, and even, I mean, 10% of them die by suicide, 70% of them attempt suicide. That's hardly congruous with seeing yourself as perfect. It's the behaviours that bother them, not their self-perception. They, they simply how can, give you, up. how can you kill, kill yourself and see yourself as perfect? Because you, this perfection cannot be expressed, cannot be manifested. There is something the transmission mechanism broke down. This is precisely what frustrates the borderline to the point of committing suicide. It's as if she cannot manifest or cannot express who she really is. As if she keeps broadcasting or signaling the wrong information about her. And people get the wrong impression and consequently treat her wrongly. She misbehaves. She acts out. She sleeps around. She does drugs or alcohol or whatever. But none of this reflects who she truly is. Because I've talk, I talked to women who are borderline, as far as I'm concerned, they're borderline, and they say that they wake up in the morning and the first thing they think is they want to kill themselves. Yes. And then, and then gradually they feel slightly better throughout the and they oscillate between wanting to kill themselves and you know feeling quite yes. good about themselves and wanting to take. You would want to, you would want to kill yourself had you been deprived of the cap capacity to verbalize your thoughts. You're an intellectual. You live inside your brain. You know. Your intellect matters the most. Now imagine that I were to deprive you of, your, of the capacity to communicate your thoughts. Completely deprive you. How would you have felt? Suicidal, I should assume. Yeah, but I wouldn't feel perfect, though, would I? Because I've got that problem. You do feel perfect about your intellect, even if you don't realize it. You do feel that your intellect is perfect. Oh, you, that. you definitely do. <laughs> oh, I do not. I'm terrible at maths. Um, but but um, okay, all right. So you feel you're you very feel... grandiose when it comes to your intellect. Am um, I? I'm sorry to break the news to you. You're extremely <laughs> grandiose when it comes to your intellect. So you do you do regard your intellect as as perfection. And if I were to deprive you of the capacity to express it or manifest it in any way, shape, or form, like no way, I think you would you will have become suicidal. Similarly, the borderline believes that she has the potential to be a good person or even a perfect person. She's capable to offer love like no one else. Mm. She's capable to care for people like nobody else. She is amazing. She's so talented. She's so this and so that. And then something, an accident of nature, her upbringing, genetic, God knows what, something prevents her from manifesting or expressing who she truly is. And she's constantly dysregulated, constantly unhappy, constantly... And this is horrible because um, she could be so different given given the right circumstances, the right partner, the right um, perhaps techniques to regulate and so on and so forth. So borderlines are hell bent on, on suicide and, and so they are. You're right. It's 10 to 11% commit suicide. Because of the dissonance, because of the gap between how they perceive themselves and how others perceive them, and how they how they um, behave. There is such a gap that it breaks them. It's it's dispiriting. Okay, they um, think they could be different. But how they, how, they, how they, it seems to me that a lot of the um, traits that you've mentioned about borderline, so emotional, being emotionally unregulated, being highly sensitive, various other things. Um, are also true of autistics. And so it makes me wonder if, and we talk about it, be, it being difficult to diagnose female autistics, it seems to me that there would be likely to be quite a crossover between autism among girls and BPD, um, and that even that maybe there is no autism among girls and we're just dealing with BPD, because they, the symptoms are very similar. We do know that uh, there is some affinity between aut autism spectrum disorders and psychopathy and narcissism. Um, I am not aware of any serious studies about a, f about a crossover between autism and borderline. But as I said before, the distinctions between narcissism, borderline, this, that, in my view, are artificial. So autism and post-traumatic conditions seem to have some affinity. And if you, if you come to think of it, it makes sense. Because people with autism spectrum disorder experience rejection by peers, even by parents, 
early on. The experience of being an autist, the experience of having autism, autism spectrum disorder, is an experience of rejection, of humiliation, of uh, pain, of suffering. So it's in itself a kind of trauma. Have you published on this? Yes. What, what, what's the name of the book? Uh, not book, uh, art, uh, papers. What's the paper? I don't remember the title, but I can find it. For ten, you. Um, okay, yeah, that does make sense. Yeah, you, that it, on, on the environmental level, it would it would lead to it. Yes, I mean, I mean, I think aut 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 people with autism experience trauma by virtue of being people with autism, and then the reaction to trauma is the same. Is the same. Is grandiose defenses. Is uh, dysregulation. Is so. Of course, they would resemble. You know, it's another post-traumatic condition. To cut a long story short. That's very, very interesting. Um, so if I, if I, the other thing I wanted to ask about is, isn't it interesting that the, there was, I was reading that uh, BPD people tend to focus a lot on romantic love, idealized romantic love. Talk about what, why do you think they're so interested in romantic love? Yes, that's very true. People with borderline personality disorder, their fantasy is focused on, on the intimate partner. So we call it an object fantasy. We, we have process fantasies and object fantasy. That's an object fantasy. They're focused on the intimate partner. And culturally, and we have been conditioned um, to interact with intimate partner, partners via the conduit of romance. Romance is an organizing principle. Like, if you're with an intimate partner, you should be romantic. You should experience love. You should be, this is something we've been told over the last 300 years. The German idealists and then romanticists and, you know, We've been told that the only appropriate way to interact with an intimate partner is by being romantic and being in love, which, of course, hasn't been the case prior to the 18th century or 17th century. People haven't interacted along these lines. There was no romance. I mean, and if... And, I've, been, and, I've been wondering about that, actually. I've been thinking, because there's a book by Denis de Rougemont called, I think, is it called Love in the Western World or something like that? And, and he argues you've got basically two phases of romantic love. The period from 300 years ago and the period of the troubadours, i.e. the 1100s. And it strikes me that those are both periods where, uh, where it becomes warm. Absolutely not the same thing. No, well, Look, there, I... have been, there have been also, there have been also uh, you know, there have been also lovers and, and romantic literature in, in, uh, in the early Renaissance in, in Italy. And, I mean, it's not... It's not that love and romance are not human experiences. They're invented. And, and that's all I'm saying. But what I'm saying is they have become organizing principles. So the troubadours, for example, the precondition for troubadour romantic love and so on was that the, the, the object of love would remain unattainable, not corrupted in any way, shape or form. So the troubadour literature, poetry and so on, was about uh, imaginary or unattainable figures like celebrities of today. You know, hmm. uh, this was not, it's not the same as romantic love today. Today, you simply know there's no other way to interact with an intimate partner. In the in the period prior to the 17th century or 18th century, more precisely, in the period prior to the 18th century, it was mostly transactional. Romantic love was the was confined to literature, or confined to the imagination, or confined to erotomanic fantasies like the lady, the lady in the castle, you know, this kind of thing. It wasn't real. It wasn't translated into sex, into cohabitation, into no way. It 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 had nothing to do with real life. It was an embellishment, not the core. People. People came together transactionally. They came together in order to merge estates or land or in order to create a family, in order to have children. It was a transaction. It was all transactional. So in the 12th century or 10th century, your intimate partner would be your business partner. But today your intimate partner is the, the object of your infatuation and limerence and uncontrollable urges and, and so on. And that's why we there is a close affinity between the modern conception of romantic love and pathology. It's an addiction. 
It's a pathology. It's absolutely pathological, biochemically as well. So presumably a woman that was a borderline personality, precisely because she would have all these insecurities and things like this, and on the one hand, she would be deeply attracted to a man who was narcissistic or who used to be BPD or whatever. But on the other hand, she would be attracted to a stable, boring man who was very different from her, but, you know, like had money. I mean, they'd be, they'd, they'd, she'd be torn between the romantic and the practical. Not, not likely. Not likely with the borderline. I mean, they're gold diggers. That's, what you're describing is more typical of a psychopath. Right. But a borderline, no. A borderline would place emphasis on, on, on the trauma, on the traumatic wound. She, she, she has homing mechanisms. She, she identifies immediately the, the injury or the wound, what, what Freud called the archaic wound. It is a bonding of, of pathologies. She gets attached to the pain of the partner. She believes that because the partner has experienced this pain, he would be able to regulate hers. Mm. Because, he, because he's so confident and so amazing and so accomplished, it must mean that he, he has some secret formula, secret source on how to control the pain, how to mitigate and ameliorate the trauma. So he's the solution to all her problems. He's he, he's he's found he's found the the magic formula, you know. The, and so she inexorably is drawn towards him, towards that person. But the condition is an initial trauma, an initial pain. She would not be attracted, definitely, to a boring, uh, run-of-the-mill multi-billionaire. That's of no interest. She needs to feel the pain, the bleeding. She's like a shark. She homes in on the bleeding in the intimate part. But controlled bleeding. Okay. Well, it's an absolutely fascinating discussion. I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Sam for coming on again. I hope, chaps, if you're getting attracted to a borderline, you, you, you watch this and you've, you've learned a thing or two about them and, and, uh, and, and what to do. And um, Sam, so remember to subscribe to Sam's channel. Um, it's just Sam Vaclin. You can put it into YouTube. And are you working on a book at the moment or anything like that, Sam? Uh, yeah, I'm actually about to publish one. What's that on, about? Uh, it's a bit of an academic thing. It's about um, recasting personality, class, uh, class B personality disorders as post-traumatic conditions, apropos what we've been discussing. Basically what we've been discussing, yeah. Okay, so look out for that, chaps, and I will see you soon, and goodbye! Thank you for having me. Ed. Thank you, pleasure. Thank you.